little bit of what we were talking about last time. So we had our Coxeter group, and for each simple reflection, we uh, encoded certain um, certain maps. from BS tensor M to BS tensor N using planar diagrams, diagrammatically. And the way that we did it is we had these basic building blocks and we had this dot right here, which is a map from BS, so you read along the bottom, to the material identity, which is reading along the top. And you had a map here, from R to BS, and then you had a map from BS, tensor BS to BS, and a map from BS to BS to BS, and then finally we had an endomorphism of the monoidal identity, which was multiplication by a polynomial in our base. So do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Uh, okay. Um, I'll write it down for your benefit just very quickly. R is a polynomial ring, it's an action of our Coxeter group, and BS is R tensor over the invariance in S to R with a shift. So that one tensor one is in degree minus one. And uh, polynomials are double the usual ring, so one year tensor. And in fact, these maps were all homogeneous maps of certain degrees. Of course, the degree of x. And we haven't, we didn't even discuss that yet. <laughs> That's the first thing we're going to do today, or almost the first thing. Yeah. So this is just for for each single reflection, we define these maps and we check various relations. So these things satisfy a couple. You know, in fact, here's a complete list of the relations that these things satisfy. We haven't proven that. Um, so there's isotopy invariance, uh, which means a whole host of things. There's the, the unit axiom that you can suck a dot and a trivalent vertex back into a line. There's associativity. Um, there's the fact that the double dot was equal to multiplication by our simple root. Uh, there's the fact that the, if you have an empty hole, that this is zero. And then there's the polynomial forcing relation. That if you have a polynomial on the left of the line, you can force it through the line at the cost of applying S and at the cost of leaving behind a term where you break the line in half and act by the Demazur operator. So this is the list of relations that we looked at last time. This is what we did last time. So now, we're going to ask what happens when we've got two colors. So now, let's suppose other simple reflections are just two colors. We already know how to make a whole bunch of maps, OK? So for instance, here's a map that we already know how to make. I'm just going to do something fairly random. So here's a map that we already know how to make. You know, from BS tensor BS tensor BT to BS, BT, BS, BT, BS, et cetera. Yes. Of this, so this is the trivalent vertex composed with the cap. Remember that a cap is defined to be a cap is defined to be this. Or maybe that's just another way of saying isotopy plus this. But um, either way. And this is 0. And remember, the reason is because you're applying the Demazur operator to the identity. Aha, yes. 
Um, and I'll sketch it later. After I do a little bit more. Okay. I'm going to erase this. So we already have um, certain maps. Uh, now, in fact, what can we say about compositions of these maps? Well, um, first off, we sort of already know that whenever we have BS tensor BS, and this decomposes into two copies of BS. So we can replace two red lines with one red line. Um, and, and so in particular, we sort of only need to explore maps where the colors alternate on the boundary. Red, green, red, green, red, green. Um, and so let's do this instead by starting with the temporal lead category. So recall that we had the temporal lead category um, where morphisms looked like this. They were built up out of sort of crossing with matchings. So you have some number of dots. On the bottom boundary, this is seven dots on the bottom and seven dots on the top. So this is a map from seven to seven in the temporal lead category. Um, and this was supposed to encode a SL2 reps. Right. Now there's some slight modification we can make to this, which is to define the colored temporal lead category. That's actually a two category. So remember that when we have a two category, we're supposed to label the regions. Well, there's just going to be two, re two different objects. Yes, yes, encodes, encodes SL2 reps in fund SL2. Sure. The tensor products of the standard. So what we're going to do is we're going to color each region with alternating colors. You know, once you choose the color on the left, that's only one way to, to color and everything else. Okay. And what you should think of is that you know, red is the category of even SL2 representations, and green is the category of odd SL2 representations. Tensoring with the standard rep takes you from an even representation to an odd representation. So this is a very natural thing to do. Um, it's sort of. You know, instead of looking at SL2 itself as a monoidal category, you look at SL2 acting on itself, <laughs> the regular representation. And because SL2 splits into even and odd, the regular representation splits into some, it becomes a two category. So this is a very natural thing to look at. But anyway, we're just going to do something very simple, which is we're going to take this color temporal lead diagram and we're going to deformation retract it. And instead, we're going to get a morphism of um, that looks something like this. And we're going to take this left little thing and deformation retract it into this. Take this thing, deformation retract it into that. Does everyone see how I did that? OK, so I took this red region, and I squeezed it up into this thing. And I took this cup, and I squeezed it into that, and so forth. OK, now oh, we have a poltergeist. Uh, there's, of course, many ways to deformation retract a region. Um, you know, it can deformation retract into any tree. However, because of associativity and because of the unit axiom, all trees are equal. So the morphism that you get from doing this is unambiguous. The real question is whether this is a, a map of algebras, a map of categories. Okay? So then the question is, does this commute with composition? Okay. And um, the answer is yes, of course. So there's two relations on the temporal lead algebra. The first is the isotopy relation. Okay. So this, remember, is a composition of two maps. It's a composition of putting a cup, a, a cup there and then a cap there. And this is supposed to be equal to the identity map. Okay. Well, what does this turn into? The bottom half of this becomes 
something that looks like this. Okay, so that cat becomes this little dot, this Y shape, this Y shape. And then the top half becomes something that looks like this. And then the result is that after we apply the unit axiom, these things pull in, and this is equal to the identity that you get from this. So that composition is OK. But then there's one other important axiom in the Tavonian algebra, which is that a closed circle is equal to minus q plus q inverse times the identity map of this region. So red is on the inside, and green is on the outside, and this becomes the identity map of the amenoid of the All right, now what does this turn into? We've got a little green ring around a red double star. This is a good exercise. Get used to this, checking that this diagram turns into this diagram. And if we apply the relations to this, this is a good exercise. The red double dot turns into alpha. Let's say that red is, um, was I saying that red is S or red is T? Which would you prefer? Red is, red is T, okay? Green is S. So this red double dot turns into alpha T. And then, um, by the version of one of these relations that I wrote down last time, not by the ones that are on the board there, this becomes the identity multiplied by the S Demeter operator of alpha. So whenever you put a polynomial and surround it by a green loop, you can break the polynomial out and apply the loop. Now the Demeter operator, the S Demeter operator of alpha t is actually just a scalar. It's just a number, and it was AST, this entry in the Cartesian. Now remember that, so, and of course, on this right-hand picture is what you get from there, except that the scalars, one is q plus q inverse, because we're, we're uh, working over a q linear category, and one is this number, ast. But remember that ast was minus 2 cos of pi over mst. That's the number that you get in a symmetric Cartan matrix, which is exactly minus Q plus Q inverse, where Q is a primitive 2mth root of unity. Just a nice little trigonometric fact. Um, and when M is infinity, Q is 1. You're supposed to get minus 2. Okay? So, um, in particular, uh, this map from the Temple Lead algebra to the category of Bob Hamilton bimodules will be, this functor will be well defined precisely when you mod out by Q equal to the appropriate rate of unity. So, um, Tom in the Temple Lead category from M to N, modulo the relation that Q is a 2 of 3 of unity, is going to map. The morphisms between Bob Samuels and bimodules from what? Well, if we have m dots on the bottom, like here we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven dots on the bottom, we will know that we have eight things here in our alternating sequence because we're counting the regions between the dots, not the dots. So there will actually be n plus one things here, alternating dot 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 of length m plus one. N plus one. And of course, we could also have a map to things where T is on the left, just by choosing which color. So we have this map. I should also point out that the image of this map is entirely in degree zero. Right? You know, the Temple Leaf algebra is generated by cups and caps, and each cup and cap is sent to a map of degree zero. So um, it's actually mapping to degree zero maps. And my claim, actually, is that this is an isomorphism. Oh, sorry. It's an isomorphism for small enough m and m. But before we get to this, let's point out um, 
what the implication of just the map is. So, you know, we wrote down formulas for what all these maps were. So, I mean, you can actually figure out explicitly what these things in the image are. So, the, uh, I was going to say the left hand side, but I guess it's the top hand side over there. The temporal leap algebra, the temporal leap category, has item posts. It has these things that we discussed in the wrong direction exercise sheet called the Jones Wenzel projectors. Um, and so, JWK, remember, was supposed to be the projection from V tensor K into the irreducible VK and then inclusion back into V tensor K. But it's some item post. And when, when, when I gave some examples, there are all these quantum numbers in the denominator. Okay, so this thing is not always well defined. It's well defined after you invert certain quantum numbers. Well, at roots of unity, so at a 2 mth root of unity, the quantum number m is actually 0. We're not going to be inverting it. And the quantum number m has to be inverted when we define the jones wenzel projector on m strands. So in fact, we can't just uh, we can't define all jones wenzel projectors. But um, at, a, at a root of unity, the k jones wenzel projector is defined for k less than or equal to m minus 1. And something actually special happens with the m minus first Jones Wenzel projector, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, so the implication of Jones Wenzel projectors and the recursive formula that we have for them was, was the basic fraction SL2 representation theory that if we tensor V with VK, we get VK plus 1 plus VK minus 1. Okay, and this is all, was, of course, only true already for K being equal to 1. You tensor V with the standard, with the trivial rep, and you get just back a V1. But in this case, because of this restriction, it's also only true when this thing right here is less than equal to M minus 1. So now we're going to transfer this fact over to observable item hosts. Okay? These item hosts go to item hosts, and so they project to some interesting modules. So let B S T S T dot 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 of size K plus one. Be the image of the item potent J W K. J W K, an endomorphism of K goes to an endomorphism of B S B T B S B T B S B T. And its image will be this thing here. And we already have notation, which it says what this thing could be. So we'll show, show soon that this agrees, that this thing is the indecomposable sum n, not appearing in any sort of terms. Okay. And exactly the same recursive formulas show that if, for instance, we take a bt and we act on b s t s t dot 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 of length, uh, k, then this is B S T S T to the thought of length K plus one plus B S T to the thought of length K minus one. And this is true because of our shifting for K bigger than equal to two. Okay, now you've already done all these dihedral group exercises. Computing with the Kazdan-Lustig basis. And we've already seen that, you know, on the Kazdan-Lustig basis, that HT times HST, ST, dot, 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 of length. Okay. It's supposed to be H, dot, 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 of length, K plus 1, plus H, dot, 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 of length, K plus Oh, shoot. These should start with T, not with S. Yeah. T, S, T, S. So this was, this was the thing we're supposed to categorify. Okay. And behold, we've just categorized. Okay. And again, um, 
uh, you know, I should say, plus and equal to m minus 1. When m is infinity, okay, q is 1, quantum numbers are the same as normal numbers, and they're all inverted. So all Jones Lenzel protectors are defined, and we can do this forever. Okay, so, you know, when this is infinity, I really mean for all k. And this is also, this, this holds in exactly the same range. And the implication of this is that in uh, is that you know if we identify um, B S with H S that is the symbol of B S in the Grothendieck group with H S we haven't yet proven the Grothendieck group but that's more than heck out of we know this from circles categorization then the implication is that the symbol of the S T S T dot 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 is precisely and they satisfy the same requirement. And then by Zergel's Hahn formula, one then deduces that this object has a trivial endomorphism. Its endomorphism ring has nothing in negative degree, it's scalars in degree zero, and therefore it's indecomposable. And therefore it is the indecomposable Zergel bilateral. That is the that we okay. So then by Zergel's, by Zergel's Hahn formula, BS DST is indecomposable um, and is the, it agrees with earlier notation. Okay, so again, the question is have we proven the Zergel, have we proven Zergel's categorification theorem yet? And the answer is if this is something you're willing to trust, if you're willing to take Zergel's word for it, then then everything that I'm saying is not bullshit at all. And if we haven't proven Ziggler's categorification formula yet, this will actually be a way to, to prove it. Um, it's not so hard, actually, to show that the endomorphism of this thing is actually just one dimensional. Degree zero and zero dimensional and less. This is actually fairly straightforward. I actually do that explicitly in the Daido. Something that you can either quote the Zirgel Hahn formula or you can make some sort of diagrammatic argument. So that's how things seem to work for Dahigo groups. In fact, it tells you almost everything you need to know about infinite type groups. What about when m is infinity? Sorry, when m is finite? Right, then this process stops at a certain point, but we now have, have uh, sort of two descriptions of the STST dot 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 of, of length M and the TSTS dot 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 of length M. We have descriptions of these things. And these are supposed to be isomorphic. Okay, so it's to be one indecomposable for each element of the I'm gonna write W0 for this longest element of the finite law. Okay? So Well, okay, so no, no. These are these are diagrams representing morphisms of these circle platforms. I haven't even defined as a diagrammatic category. I'm actually just taking morphisms in circle bimodules and encoding them. But I'm saying that I've constructed an item potent. You construct an item potent. That doesn't mean its image is the indecomposable satisfying certain properties, but in fact it is. Yes, exactly. A diagrammatic construction of the item mode, but that's good because we have a diagrammatic language we're discussing actual morphisms. Um, we'll define the diagrammatic category in a second. If you want to, if, you know, again, there's alternative ways. Anyway, the point is that these are supposed to be isomorphic. Okay, so let's say it another way. We have the Vought Samuelson bimodule of length m. And it has a sum and, which is this guy right here. And this guy is also a sum and in this other non-isomorphic bot Samuelson. And so that means that there should be some map from here to here of degree 0. 
and there should be some map back of degree zero, such that if you go there and back, this is projection the BWs. So again, we're only drawing morphisms between Sandelson and Bunch. So between BS, BT, BS, BT, BS, BT. We're not drawing morphisms between these guys. These guys are represented by item potents, but we're not actually finding diagrammatic map between these things. So any, any maps we find, like for instance, projection to this, we want to somehow transform into maps between Bot Samuelson by them. So instead of looking at, at this map, we actually look at all the way this comes from here. So we're going to draw these maps. You know, so for instance, when M is 5, we're, we're, so we're going to draw these. When M is 5, we need some map from red, from uh, green, red, green, red, green, which is this side, to red, green, red, green, red, which is that side. And this map we're going to draw as a, a, a vertex with, with uh, a 2M, uh, 2M valent vertex. Just make some little star shape connecting everything. And that's supposed to draw the map in this direction. Whereas if you'd reverse the colors, you'd get the map in the other direction. Now again, this is representing some very implicitly defined morphisms. Writing down a formula for the actual bimodule map that this represents, what it does to the six polynomials, is very hard. No one's bothered to do it. You can deduce it from the formula for the jones lenzel projectors, but it's still just really nasty. Okay? However, w if you think of this thing as a black box and never worry about what it does to polynomials, it ends up being not so hard to compute with. So for instance, we have this fact here that going there and back is supposed to be projection to the jones wenzel So if we go there and back, Let's just do this this example, because that's the color I have in my head. We go there and we come back. I come back. That this is some endomorphism of, of uh, TSTST, and it's supposed to be the, the Jones Wenzel projector. And it's actually the Jones is a projector on four strands, which gives rise to this. Add a rooted view to this. So maybe give a specific example. Right, when M is three, remember that normally the Jones Wenzel projector on two strands is this guy plus one over quantum two times this guy. But uh, Q is equal to a sixth root of unity which means that quantum two is actually just one. So we can actually ignore this thing. The corresponding map that this goes to is the identity here. So these are shaded red and the middle is shaded green. And then here you have this funky shape. So the identity plus some tree that I've chosen to make out of this. So we have this relation that if we compose a two invalid vertex with the opposite two valent valent vertex, that this is equal to that. Okay. So this is an example of the, a kind of relation that you get from these guys. And from this one, you can essentially guess the other ones. You can't directly deduce them. Um, but it, it's, it's not so hard to sort of guess. Okay? So there's two relations that actually together imply this one. And I'll write them down. So one of them says, so let's take a 2M valent vertex. You'll note that some of the strands are going sideways. That's because I'm using the convention from before, where I'm really working on a planar disk. And bottoms, you can plug this into something else. 
Suppose we had a dot on one of the strands. What morphism do you end up with? And the answer is something constructed with the Jones on some projector. Um, so maybe there's a, a good way of, uh, yeah, maybe I'll do it like this. So. So what we have is the jones winslow projector on, on which has four inputs and four outputs. The third jones winslow projector. There's eight strands here, so here's an example where I'm Okay? But we need something that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven outputs. What we do is we put a dot here and a dot there. Okay, so this is not usually the form that you see in my paper. Because in my paper, I like to put the Jones Wilson projector as a map of degree 2 instead of a map of degree 0. This is one of the relations that exists in this category. Um, and the other relation is that if you put a trivalent vertex over here, then this can be expressed in terms of, but you sort of pull the trivalent vertex straight through. When you pull this thing through, it's very violent and it splits it in two, like a gauge. Okay? So if you pull them through, then this guy gets split in half. So these are two relations that, you know, again, if you actually tried to write down what these were explicitly as maps between bimodules and write down these things explicitly as maps between bimodules, you could compute this. It would be a nightmare. Uh, I, you know, showed that these tr were true using sort of more abstract. Maps are there of a certain degree. There aren't many. <laughs> Can you check that they agree on a scalar? So, for instance, this map here. Um, there's one very other, uh, one more imp very important fact about it. Right, so remember that these guys have this canonical element C bot, which is one tensor, one tensor, one tensor, da da da. Okay, living in degree minus. Okay, and this guy also has, a, this is a different module, but it also has something called CBOT, also within this form. It's a different module, though. And this map actually sends CBOT to CBOT. I mean, for degree reasons, CBOT spans a one dimensional vector space. Okay? This one also, one dimensional vector space. These are maps with degree zero. Um, so uh, they must send CBOT to a scalar multiple. Bot. And uh, in fact, every term in this Jones Wenzel projector, the Jones Wenzel projector is the identity plus a bunch of other stuff. And everything that's not the identity kills C bot. And we'll be talking about this kind of computation in a sec. So, in fact, as far as C bot is concerned, C bot goes to the coefficient of the identity in here, in C bot, which is 1. Okay, so this thing must, send, must be multiplication by 1, therefore, really deep. multiplication by inverse scalars. So we have something that we can do to talk about Zergo bimodules in rank 2 now. Now we want to be able to talk about general rank. And I gave a hint as to how the rest of things work in the colloquium talk last week. So in the colloquium talk last week, so now let um, W S be arbitrary. Okay. Um, and choose um, some sub some parabolic subgroup uh, where there's three elements in it. And the corresponding parabolic subgroup is finite. It's finite. Right, so, I mean, there aren't that many kind of finite rank three Cox subgroups, right? We gave a list of them last time. There's 
A3, B3, H3, A1 cross a dihedral group, and A1 cross A1 cross A1. I suppose this is an example of that. It's nice to think of them separately. So these are the only finite dihedral groups. Wi is one of these things. And for each one of these, we're going to have a, a relation. Right, so if we let W0 be the longest element of Wi, and we draw its reduced expression graph, those of you who weren't there in previous things, this is the graph where each vertex has a reduced expression and each edge is an application of the gradient. Okay. Um, then each vertex has so some reduced expression for the longest element. And for that, we can associate the corresponding bot sandals. Okay. Each edge is uh, some sort of application of a braid relation. These two only differ by a braid relation. And to that, we can associate the corresponding 2M valent vertex, right, which applies, say, one of these braid these 2M valent vertices in the appropriate place and does the identity to everything else. So to each path, we get a morphism. And I like to call morphisms of this form Rex moves. They're just sort of moves between reduced expressions. Okay. So unlike the colloquium talk that I gave last Thursday, these Rex moves aren't isomorphisms. Okay. The last time we were talking about sort of a, a group action of the Coxeter group, where you don't associate it with the bot Samuelson, you associate it some other natural thing. And, and these, are, this, these are then isomorphisms, and the, the edge going backwards was the inverse edge. But now, this thing is a projection to a common sum end. Okay? And so going there and going back is not the identity. It's projection to the sum end. Um, and so going around in a circle, you don't expect to get an identity. You don't expect two paths between any two vertices to agree on the nose. However, you still accept some relation between them. Okay? So, you know, these are not isomorphisms. Um, so, just to give you an example of what one of these things look like, and you're going to have to be doing many more, I guess, in your exercises. Here's type A3. Suppose you should give colors to each of these guys. Maybe S is blue, T is red, U is green. And the reduced expression graph of this guy, remember, looks like something. And you know, here's, um, I'll draw it again. So the reduced expression graph of this element looks like this. The equal signs are braid relations when m is 2, and the single edges are braid relations when m is 3. So this, for instance, is applying this thing here to get gs. And to each path, to this path from here to here, we have a path morphism. From this path from here to here, they have a path morphism. So I'll draw one of them for you. So um, this one on the left looks like this. See if I do this well. That's what S looks like. Um, this is what uh, T looks like. S T S U T S goes to U T U S. I'm very good at these. Uh, 
And so basically I apply this one and then that one and then this one and then that one and so forth. And I get a particular morphism in our cat. The double lines are when MSP is 2. So those correspond to these kind of problems, these four valent vertices, whereas the single ones correspond to this system. And then there's another path that we can take going from here to here, which is sort of the one that's dual to this one. If you look at what just blue looks like, we have half of an associativity equality. And so if we apply associativity to this, to the blue guy, it should look like this. And, and that's actually what's going to happen inside this. Similarly to the green guy, we have half of an upside down associativity, co-associativity. That's what's going to happen to the green guy, and the red guy is going to be flipped around. So now I have to make sure that I put everything in the right place, but this goes there, and then there. Um, and then there. That's the other one. Look. So. Yeah, this is a very good point. One has to practice a lot, OK? So you can do that as fast as I do. OK? But nonetheless, the point is, here they are. These are two maps. They both send C bot to C bot. OK? They both send the lowest degree thing to the lowest degree thing. OK? So in fact, they're equal up to, so to speak, lower terms. So these needn't be equal. They could be, but they needn't be equal. But equal on C bot. Okay, so it turns out, up to in a sense that I'll be defining soon, they're actually equal modulo lower terms. I haven't defined what lower terms are, but they are actually equal modulo lower terms. And so there should be some relation between them. So already, you know, if we have a path in the reduced expression graph that starts here, goes there, and comes right back. Okay, we already know how to say that that's equal to the identity modulo lower terms. That's exactly this relation right here. Okay, go there, come back. That's the jones wenzel projector, which is the identity plus a bunch of other things. Okay, but there's nothing straight from that that's going to say that if we go around here in this loop, that we get the identity. That is some genuine new relation. But if you sort of imply that these two paths are equal, then that will tell you that you know this path and that path are equal. Okay, so we just need one relation to account for the um, for the monodromy in this one. Those are just crossings. <laughs> That's correct. So th it's right here in the middle. Okay. So you're at this reduced expression graph here. So it's uh, let's see if I can say it. T S U T U S, and you're going to T U S T S U. What you're doing is you're switching S and U, and you're switching S and U. And in fact, it doesn't matter what order you do them in because they commute in the monoidal category. Okay. You do it here first, or you do it here first. And in fact, I drew them side to side. I should have chosen one of them to go first, but I didn't because there's no point. So what? Exactly. So yeah, yeah, and this is something that, that I talked about in the full table lecture as well. And in another category, this kind of monodromy, this disjoint square is irrelevant. You might as well just collapse the disjoint squares. It's an, it's an equality that always holds in the monodromy. Okay, and again, over here, it's the same. Well, in this case, they are equal. Okay, these two morphisms that I drew, you go and you compute with them. And I actually did this in the first table with Kalana. These are actually equal. However, however, had I started with this guy, and I had I drawn this morphism here and this morphism here, then those are not equal. Okay, it's actually just good luck that this that these two paths happen to be. 
But these two bads are not equal. This is one of the exercises. It's to, it's to show that these two things are not equal. There's something here? Yes, there's a, well, okay, so I've uh, uh, proven that in type A, there's a canonical orientation on these, on these reduced expression. Well, the fact that there's a canonical orientation on reduced expression graphs in type A was proven by the name check. But I've proven that if you take two oriented paths, then oriented paths are equal to type A. Um, I guess that follows kind of directly, but I've used that. <laughs> Nonetheless, so in type A, it's not just a lock. And in type B, they are also equal on the nodes if you choose the correct source and sink. If I choose the wrong source and sink, they're not equal. But if I choose the right source and sink, they're equal. And that fact should doesn't have any reason yet in the literature, so this is, which leads me to believe that there's a type B. As well. But in type H, there's genuinely no choice of source and sink such that the two paths are equal on the nodes. You will always need some low in type H for H. This is, this is the only one that's natural. But I mean, even so, if you hadn't chosen the orientation correctly, you need to know. Yes, there's some independent reason why one has an orientation. Which I can explain in this way as well. So the point is that there should be some relation you know, left-hand side is equal to right-hand side, or left-hand side minus right-hand side equal to lower terms. So some nebulous relation of this form, which you can compute explicitly by plugging it into a computer and figuring out what these lower terms are. You choose one path, you choose another path, you find the lower terms. And that is your new relation, your three-color relation. Okay, so there's one three-color relation for each thing of this form. And are there any four color relations? The answer is no. The identity module and plus some more. Whichever loop you take. Yeah, it's enough to put one. Yeah. Exactly. And as discussed on Thursday, loops that come from these longest elements give you all loops and all reduced expression graphs from all cocks. So once you have the statement that going around this loop is the identity module lower terms. Then for any element in any Coxeter degree, you can define this reduced expression graph, and any loop in that reduced expression graph will be the identity module. So that is the functional purpose of doing this. It's to say that any two Rex moves are always equal modules. what I like to do is just write down this and say that whenever you have three colors inside them that form an A3 configuration, you just have this one. The A3 relation is universal <laughs> for all A3s. That's a computation. I mean, yeah, uh, I, I I mean, so for instance, this thing has a basis, so it um, has a right R module. It's six terms, so 64 dimensional, or sorry, rank 64. Okay. You can write down a basis and just check. But actually, since it's bilinear, as a, you only, there's actually only um, eight. That you can find eight things that generate it, not freely, as a bimodule, and just check on those eight that are uh, for type B, it's much bigger. 
And then so Jordi actually wrote a computer program and verified that the two sides are equal. And for type H, in fact, the computers aren't big enough, so we don't know what's always true. We do know that it's not equal. We do know that we ha one has to actually figure out what the lowest terms are. But there's an awful, it's like a 2 to the 74 by 2 to the 74 matrix or something that the computer knows. So the supercomputer in Bond couldn't figure it out. So. We'd, and, and you know, if you actually find someone who cares that much about type H, that the lower term, when the specific lower terms are important, then point that person to me and I'll make them write a program. OK. Uh, so yeah, this is an open problem, but it's not a particularly exciting one. It's not. I mean, if you can improve the algorithm so that this becomes doable, then that's that's great. Uh, there's two to the six. Well, as a right module, as a right R module, it is it is to the six. You do count all of them. Yes, for instance, just one thing. But as a bimodule, BS is generated by one. You know, so as a bimodule, you can slide a lot of things out, right? So that's why there's only, you know, there's only eight. It's only eight dimensional as a bimodule. Here I rank eight because um, you can slide things to the right and left, but some alpha S is stuck between these two blues, some other alpha S is stuck between these, some alpha T is stuck between these two reds. And that's what gets stuck. So there's three things that get stuck. So, um, so what, we, we, what we've done so far, again, is we've taken a bunch of legitimate maps between R bimodules. We've encoded them diagrammatically. We've found some relations between them. And we want to prove that these are all the relations and that these are, that these, that compositions of these diagrams give you all the maps. So let's just, you know, say, let's just define, um, so let D be the monoidal category. given by generators and relations. As previous. OK, so these are no longer bimodules. These are just some abstract things. Um, and I'm not going to write down all the generators and relations, but again, you can look it up if you really want to. And let f be the functor from this diagrammatic category to bot samuelson bimodules, which of course sends the generator S to BS, and it acts on the, you know, the, these generators, like, uh, you know, they send them to the usual Fubenius maps, Fubenius structure maps. And of course it sends multiplication by F to multiplication by F. And what it does to this stupid, uh, MST valent vertex. So as I said, what the actual map this goes to is, is it has no close formula at the moment. But you can still show that there is a specific map satisfying some certain properties that it gives. Uh, and you don't even particularly care what it is. Okay, so actually finding a close formula for this could be very useful. Um, and so then the theorem of myself and Jordy is that F is well defined, which is to say the relations that I wrote down are in fact relations, um, and is an equivalence of categories. So that is when the right hand side is nice. So when so it's actually not an equivalence of categories in more general contexts than I've started. But I've defined everything over the real numbers, and I've given you a symmetric uh, cartan matrix. And, and in fact, in this, in this, it is an equivalence of categories. Yes. Yes. Although, you know, in characteristic two, for instance, the fact that, you know, I define this thing as going to alpha s over 2, uh, tensor 1 plus 1 tensor alpha tensor alpha s over 2, right? So in characteristic 2, what do you send it to, right? Well, it has to go to this canonical co-product element. 
But if, in fact, Rs into R is not a Frobenius extension, then there is no canonical cookbook. And so in characteristic two, depending on the Cartan matrix, Rs into R may or may not be a Frobenius. So if the, the row, if the, if the column in the Cartan matrix generates an ideal in the base ring, and if that ideal contains the unit, if the unit ideal, then it's a Frobenius extension. And if not, then not. So in that case, this functor won't be. There is a little bit already into the well defined this. But then if this, if you can actually define it on the maps, then the relation is definitely whole. The relation is definitely whole. Uh, the fact that it's an equivalence again very much relies on the fact that the, well, that the reflection of representation is fake. Standard argument you face in the categorical function. Yeah, you have some diagrammatic thing. You have no reason to say that your your diagrammatic category is one size or another, or that it acts on something. Um, I suppose I was going to try to do this argument after the point. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but the injectivity is basically the fact that the light waves are multiple cases, which you can prove independently. Of the fact that they are good or the fact that they're linearly independent is the objectivity. And that, inject, that linearly independent is proven in a different way. Than the fact that they're yes. Yeah. Uh, so there's other proofs for dihedral groups and other proofs for, for type A that were given in the original paper. So we'll go about this. Right, so remember that for a Frobenius extension, you need a map from R to Rs, okay? And you need the, there to exist dual bases, right? So Ds of uh, Ds of Ai, Ai dual is okay. Ai dual is delta I. Okay, but in particular, this means that delta S is surjective. And there's something whose denizer operator is one, okay? But remember that Ds of alpha T is ASD, and uh, you know, so you're, and these things span the linear terms, so the only things you're ever going to get in the image are things in the ideal of this. So uh, if this ideal is not the unit ideal, obviously it's not. And if it is the unit ideal, then choosing anything, so if, if ds of alpha is 1, then 1 alpha and s alpha one or minus s alpha one give you a dual basis. Yeah, and in fact, that's sufficient. But you know, then there's a harder question, which is sort of like, when is R i inside R j also a Frobenius? And this is actually there's no known criteria. So this is there's some exercise. That when 3 is invertible and M is, is er, when M is invertible and M is, then RS inside R is a Frobenius um, But I'm not actually even sure that this is a requirement. Certainly I can construct dual bases when M is invertible, but I don't know that I can't construct dual bases when M is invertible. Then, you know, the general question is fine. So that's all part of this question. Com define combinatorial dual bases. If only Schubert calculus would work, it would be OK. But unfortunately, equivariant Schubert calculus is not well defined. It is not yet developed. So. Uh, and I suppose, you know, as I said in the beginning, we don't just have to work with this vanilla represent reflection representation. Right? I mean, like, we, the alpha t's don't have to be a basis of the representation. They just have to exist in the so if instead we extend our basis by some other thing for which ds of that is 1, then congratulations to the other Even in characteristic two. Right? So one, one can work with any Cartan matrix that one wants by extending. 